On the internet, you see a lot of posts like this. A lot of men, myself included, having this fantasy of the last stand, of fighting on despite overwhelming numbers to either fight for something or to provide time for something. The idea of having a meaningful death, to sacrifice oneself for a greater cause, to give meaning to one's death. However romanticized this idea is, I think that it really hides the horror of the encirclement, the slow realization that you are going to die, that there is no miracle breakthrough, no sudden relief force, nothing but the dreaded feeling that you are not going to live through this battle, that even if your death means a later victory, you are still going to die. Throughout history, battles have been fought, won, and lost, with each conflict leaving a mark on the world. But some moments in warfare go beyond strategy or territory. They become unforgettable nightmares of survival, courage, and horror. These are the moments when soldiers find themselves not just outmatched, but surrounded, trapped with no path to freedom and no hope of rescue. In these rare encounters, the battlefield transforms into a place of dread, where men are forced to confront their own mortality in the most harrowing of circumstances. Today, we're revisiting four of history's most terrifying encirclements, where soldiers faced overwhelming odds, relentless enemies, and the looming certainty of death. First, we'll step onto the sun-scorched plains of Cannae, where Hannibal's cunning outmatched Rome's might and brought an army to its knees. Then, we'll turn to Jerusalem, where walls meant to protect its people became prisons as starvation and despair took hold. In 1809, the hills of Tarvis witnessed a brutal encirclement that left Austrian forces stranded, surrounded, and helpless in the fog of war. Finally, we'll journey to the Little Bighorn, where Custer's last stand became a haunting symbol of pride and fatal miscalculation. These are more than battles. They're stories of human endurance, fear, and the unrelenting face of death. 216 BCE The August sun blazed over the plains of Cannae, but for Rome's soldiers, that heat was the least of their fears. Surrounded by the Carthaginian forces of Hannibal, they were caught in a trap so ruthless that even their veteran ranks were paralyzed with dread. The battle was not just a loss, it was a massacre, a calculated slaughter that would forever stain Rome's legacy. For the soldiers trapped inside Hannibal's tightening noose, it was a terrifying descent into darkness, each one coming face to face with their mortality. The Roman army, 80,000 strong, stood in their glimmering armor under the relentless sun, exuding strength and discipline. Yet under the surface lay tension. They were led by consuls Lucius Aemilius Paulus and Gaius Terentius Vero, who believed sheer numbers would crush Hannibal at last. But Hannibal was calm, watchful, and far more cunning than they realized. His smaller force, barely half the size, formed an unusual crescent shape with a deliberate weakness at its center. As the Romans surged forward, they took the bait, pushing deep into Carthaginian lines, believing victory was at hand. But little did they know, they were stepping into a deadly trap. As the Romans advanced, Hannibal's men tightened their formation. His African infantry on the flanks surged inward, curving around to encircle the Roman soldiers completely. Realization struck like a bolt. They were trapped. The open battlefield turned into a prison of bodies, shields, and desperation. No escape, no way back. The Carthaginians closed in, the noose tightening with brutal precision sealing the fate of thousands. For the Roman soldiers encircled in that brutal trap, reality shifted into a nightmare. Shoulder to shoulder, shield against shield, they felt the crushing weight of thousands around them. The press of metal and bodies so close they could barely move, let alone fight. The air grew thick with the stench of sweat, blood, and fear. A suffocating miasma that clawed at their senses. Some tried to turn back, desperate for any path to freedom, but only found themselves pressed tighter, caught in the grip of their own ranks. The Carthaginians advanced step by step, relentlessly, choking off every avenue of escape, 
drawing the noose tighter. The world grew smaller, darker. The sunlight dimmed as the press of bodies became an overwhelming shadow, blotting out the sky. For those at the center of this crushing mass, the claustrophobia became as deadly as any blade. It was no longer a battle, it was a killing ground, where each Roman soldier felt the terrifying inevitability of death. Inside that ring of death, chaos reigned. Men were stabbed, hacked, and trampled, their cries lost in the storm of terror and steel. There was no room to lift their shields, no space to wield a sword. At the front, they met Hannibal's seasoned warriors, while at the back, they faced the relentless crush of their own comrades. It was a slow, agonizing death, suffocated by bodies or impaled by unseen blades. The Carthaginians were methodical, a machine of death grinding down every Roman, sparing none. As the Carthaginian infantry closed in further, each soldier knew his fate. They were trapped in a mass grave, each heartbeat marking the end of another comrade's life. The horror was inescapable. Death had come, silent and unyielding, leaving no hope of escape. By the day's end, 50,000 Romans lay lifeless on the field. Those who survived the encirclement were captured, enslaved, broken in both body and spirit. The plains of Cannae, once teeming with the pride of Rome, were now a vision of horror, a landscape littered with armor, torn banners, and bodies strewn across blood-soaked earth. For Rome, the Battle of Cannae would become a scar on its memory, a brutal reminder that even the mightiest could fall. Hannibal's triumph was complete, a victory drenched in the blood and terror of Rome's finest. The survivors would carry the memories of that day forever, haunted by the S.C. Reams, the stench, the shadowed circle where they had faced not just defeat, but the complete annihilation of hope. The devastation of Cannae taught Rome a harsh lesson. Even the strongest could falter against cunning and strategy. Yet, Rome endured, learning from its darkest defeats to forge an empire that would span continents. But as it grew, so did its ruthlessness. Centuries later, that same relentless determination would be turned against the walled city of Jerusalem. In 70 CE, during the Roman siege, it was not Rome encircled, but Jerusalem, its defenders facing the same hopeless inevitability. The crushing might of Rome, once humbled at Cannae, had become the very force of annihilation it once feared. History, it seems, has a way of repeating its darkest moments. In the summer of 70 CE, the city of Jerusalem became a place of unimaginable suffering. Trapped within its thick stone walls, the people and soldiers faced a Roman siege that stretched across agonizing months, descending into horror with each passing day. This wasn't just a battle. It was an unyielding encirclement where every attempt to break free was crushed, every day filled with the gnawing dread of what was to come. The defenders had believed their great walls would hold, that Jerusalem's fortifications would stand against Rome's onslaught. But as General Titus tightened his grip, the siege became a slow-motion nightmare. Roman siege engines towered outside, their shadow falling ominously over the city as they inched closer. As the Romans advanced, they encircled the city entirely, cutting off every escape route, sealing the fate of those within. The people could feel the grip tightening, the weight of their doom pressing down as supplies dwindled and hope faded. With weeks turning into months, a new terror set in, starvation. Food supplies vanished, and the streets became haunted by the starving and the sick. Rumors spread of hidden stores hoarded by the wealthy, but those too soon ran out. Desperate families picked through refuse, gnawing on leather, tree bark, and any scraps they could find. It was a slow death that crept into every home, sparing no one. For the defenders, the battle had become an internal war against their own hunger and thirst, a fight as brutal as any encounter with the enemy. The people, once proud and resilient, became shadows of themselves, hollow-eyed and haunted by the knowledge that they were being slowly destroyed from within. Disease spread like wildfire as bodies began piling up in the streets 
the stench of decay filling the city. Entire neighborhoods fell silent, turned into open graves as the weak and dying lay abandoned. The air was thick with heat and death, a haze that hung over the city, smothering what little hope remained. Roman soldiers watched from outside, noting the thinning ranks of Jerusalem's defenders, the gaunt faces of those who remained. Inside, chaos reigned as desperation turned people against one another, rioting for scraps, scavenging in fear, while families huddled together in silence, waiting for the end. When the assault finally came, it was brutal and relentless. Roman siege engines hammered Jerusalem's walls, and the city's last defenses crumbled under the weight of boulders and fire. Starved and exhausted, the defenders could barely hold their ground. Their weapons slipped from hands too weak to hold them, their bodies too frail to resist the Roman legions now storming through their city. The sight of Roman soldiers flooding into Jerusalem's streets was the final blow, a confirmation that the nightmare had reached its darkest hour. There was no escape. They advanced with shields raised, swords flashing, showing no mercy as they pressed through every neighborhood, courtyard, and home. The streets filled with the dying, the cries of the wounded echoing through the city's once proud walls. Inside Jerusalem, horror reached its peak. Roman soldiers moved like shadows through the narrow streets, sparing no one, cutting down soldiers, citizens, and children alike. The bloodshed was beyond comprehension. Alleys and squares became rivers of blood, slick with the remains of those who had once lived there. The fires from the burning buildings cast an eerie glow over the city, revealing bodies sprawled in every direction, families clutching each other in final moments, neighbors turned strangers in the face of horror. In their final moments, many sought refuge in the temple, clinging to it as their last sanctuary. But the Romans showed no mercy. Flames consumed the sacred grounds, reducing it to ashes as soldiers cut down anyone who remained. The city was transformed into a death trap, a place where no wall, no sanctuary could shield them. Desperation led some to surrender, but surrender offered no safety here. Mercy was a foreign concept as Roman vengeance swept through the city. For those who believed their walls would keep them safe, Jerusalem had become a tomb. The very defenses they had trusted were now the barriers to their escape, trapping them in a nightmare from which there was no waking. By the time the assault ended, Jerusalem lay in ruins. The city that had once thrived now stood silent, its streets covered with the bodies of the dead. Those few who survived were enslaved or executed, their families shattered, their homes reduced to rubble. For those who endured the siege, the memories would haunt them for a lifetime. The stench of death, the cries of the desperate, the visions of friends and family dying in their arms. The nightmare had ended, but its echoes would linger, an unrelenting reminder of the horror that had unfolded within Jerusalem's walls. The siege of Jerusalem in 70 CE was a chilling testament to the relentless power of Rome, a victory carved from the agony and annihilation of its enemies. In 1809, the hills of Tarvis, Italy, saw the haunting echoes of that same horror. The serene landscape transformed into a blood-soaked arena, a place where Austrian soldiers would face their own encirclement, each one knowing they would not return. In 1809, the quiet Italian town of Tarvis became a scene of horror. Encircled by Napoleon's forces, the soldiers of the Austrian Empire found themselves isolated in the mountainous passes of northeastern Italy, a region usually known for its serene beauty. But on this day, those same hills closed in around them, cutting off every path to freedom. Every glance at the towering peaks felt like the land itself was conspiring to bury them. The once green valleys became a cage, and the Austrian forces under General Albert Gulai faced the chilling realization they were trapped with no way out. The fog hung thick over the battlefield, shrouding the soldiers and filling the air with an oppressive silence. Each sound, a distant voice, the snap of a twig, was enough to send shivers through even the most hardened men. 
Hidden within the mist, the French and Italian forces moved like ghosts, unseen, yet always there, surrounding the Austrians with an almost supernatural precision. Fear began to seep through the ranks, turning each soldier into a specter of his former self, his courage drained by the creeping certainty of death. With supplies dwindling and hope fading, the Austrian soldiers felt the noose tightening. Each day became a test of survival, their once strong spirits broken by the quiet, suffocating knowledge that they were prey, hunted, and helpless. On May 17th, the battle erupted in a brutal assault. French and Italian soldiers surged forward, their bayonets gleaming, their advance merciless. The Austrians put up a desperate defense, driven not by hope, but by the raw instinct to survive. Gunfire crackled through the fog, mingling with the screams of the wounded as the ground turned slick with blood. It was as if the earth itself consumed the fallen, swallowing soldiers on both sides in a ravenous, endless hunger for destruction. Those who fell were trampled by comrades and enemies alike, their bodies lost in the haze of combat. Faces froze in twisted expressions of terror, and as the hours passed, the once proud soldiers became indistinguishable from the mud and debris around them. For those still fighting, the horror grew with each second, a relentless march toward an end they could neither see nor prevent. As the encirclement tightened, the Austrian soldiers knew no reinforcements were coming. Every line they tried to hold was met with unyielding French resistance. The fog concealed their enemies, who struck from the shadows, slipping in and out with ruthless efficiency. The battle had become a slow, torturous death. Each moment a struggle just to keep breathing, to keep fighting, even as they felt death pressing in. Among the Austrian forces were young men who had barely tasted life, now trapped in a foreign land, far from home. For them, the horror was deeper, a nightmare from which there would be no waking. They had been led into an inescapable prison abandoned by fate, watching friends and comrades fall with every passing hour. Whispers of surrender began to spread through the ranks. Soldiers weighed their chances, knowing that capture by the French could mean further horror. But with every passing moment, surrender seemed less like a choice and more like a desperate plea for mercy. The commanders, too, felt the crushing weight of their own failure, haunted by the knowledge that they had led their men into this merciless trap. For the survivors, each hour felt like a lifetime, a relentless dance with death as the enemy closed in, bodies piling up and hope slipping away. They could smell the rot of the battlefield, hear the flies buzzing over the fallen, a grim soundtrack to the end of their days. When the Austrian forces finally broke, it was swift and ruthless. Exhausted and outnumbered, they could no longer resist as the French surged forward, delivering the final blow. Those who attempted to flee were hunted down. Those who resisted met their end on bayonets and bullets. The battlefield became a wasteland, a sea of fallen bodies blending with the earth. For the few who survived, the memories would be a haunting legacy, etched deep into their minds, a nightmare of blood, terror, and the endless struggle to survive. Tarvis had become a graveyard, a place where courage and hope were swallowed by the unyielding cruelty of war. Nearly seven decades later, across the world on the plains of Montana, another encirclement would spell doom. Custer and his men of the 7th Cavalry faced the fury of a united native force, charging headlong into a brutal ambush that would come to define their legacy as Custer's last stand. In the summer of 1876, the plains of Montana witnessed one of the most infamous defeats in American military history. Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer, confident and unyielding, led over 200 soldiers of the 7th Cavalry into the valley of the Little Bighorn River, determined to subdue the native tribes resisting U.S. expansion. But as they approached, an unsettling realization crept in. Reports warned of a massive encampment, yet Custer pressed on, dismissing the danger. He divided his forces, 
riding directly into a trap that would forever be etched in American memory. Cresting the hills overlooking the little bighorn, Custer's men came face to face with the reality of their mission. A sprawling native encampment stretching across the valley, vastly outnumbering them. This was not a small band of raiders, but a united force of Lakota Sioux, Northern Cheyenne, and Arapaho warriors. They were prepared, defending their land with fierce resolve. For Custer's men, there was no turning back, only the crushing certainty that they had ridden into a nightmare. In an instant, the attack began. Warriors surged from the encampment, a powerful wave sweeping up the hills with unrelenting fury. Battle cries, gunfire, and the thunder of hooves filled the air. The Seventh Cavalry, taken by surprise, found themselves cut off, surrounded by thousands of warriors who closed in from every direction. Panic gripped Custer's men as the realization of entrapment set in. Every direction was blocked. Every attempt to retreat was met with unyielding force. Dust and smoke rose, obscuring their view, turning the day into a haze of confusion. Custer, at the center, ordered them to hold their ground. But his voice was drowned out in the chaos. The circle around them grew tighter, the warriors pressing in with relentless determination, turning the battlefield into a deadly spiral of violence. As the native forces advanced, each cavalryman felt the creeping dread of his fate. Soldiers who had once prided themselves on their bravery now faced terror they could not escape. The ground beneath them was soon littered with the fallen, comrades lying trampled, while the air became thick with the cries of the wounded and the war chants of the warriors closing in. The battle devolved into pure chaos. Bullets flew, arrows rained down, and spears struck from every side. Soldiers huddled back to back, desperately trying to fend off the onslaught. Ammunition ran low, and the desperation grew, each man knowing he was facing his final moments. There was no sanctuary, no cover, only the realization that this was where their lives would end, far from home, surrounded by an unbreakable wall of warriors defending their families and land. Custer himself was trapped in the fray, his golden hair streaked with dust and sweat, his eyes fixed with grim resignation. Around him, his men fell one by one, and he was powerless to save them. Everywhere he turned, he saw the fury of warriors defending their homeland, each strike more forceful, more deadly, until there was nothing left to fight with but sheer desperation. As the sun began to dip below the horizon, the nightmare reached its bloody conclusion. Exhausted, the soldiers' faces turned pale with terror and exhaustion, their strength drained by the endless fight. Some attempted to flee, but they were quickly overtaken. Others tried to surrender, but surrender was not an option in this battle. The native warriors pressed forward, driven by a cause that would not allow mercy for the intruders on their land. By dusk, every man who had fought alongside Custer lay scattered across the plains, their bodies silent, the earth around them marked by the struggle and bloodshed. The battlefield was a haunting sight, a landscape turned graveyard where the fallen lay beneath the fading light. As the final echoes of battle faded, silence blanketed the little bighorn. The native warriors stood among the fallen soldiers, catching their breath, their faces, solemn as they surveyed the cost of victory. The once proud cavalry had been reduced to silence, their ambitions swallowed by the fury of a people defending their way of life. The battlefield was now still. The last rays of the sun casting an eerie glow over the scattered bodies, a sobering reminder of what had just transpired. For the native forces, this was the defense of their land and their families, a battle that had turned the tide, if only briefly, against those who sought to take their homes. For Custer's men, it was a final, desperate stand that ended in death and silence, a ghostly reminder of their leader's hubris and their own dashed hopes. The memory of Custer's last stand would linger, a haunting tale told for generations, a symbol of what it means to be surrounded, facing death 
with no escape. The soldiers, who had once ridden with confidence, were left as specters, forever marking the plains with the legacy of their defeat. Stories of that day spread far and wide, a testament to the terror of encirclement and the crushing finality that followed. For Custer and his men, the Little Bighorn would be remembered not as a place of heroism, but as a haunting reminder of ambition met with unyielding retribution. The Battle of Little Bighorn stands as a sobering symbol of what unfolds when pride blinds men to their own peril, when a people defending their land confront an invader. The plains of Montana, forever marked by that battle, bear witness to a struggle that would haunt both the victors and the fallen. A memory of the horrors that accompany war and encirclement. These battles, the ones that leave us with stories of entrapment, fear, and unimaginable loss, are more than historical events. They're profound reminders of the human cost of conflict and the brutal realities that soldiers have faced across centuries. The plains of Cannae, the city walls of Jerusalem, the foggy hills of Tarvis, and the open plains of Little Bighorn all stand as solemn witnesses to moments when men were pushed to their limits. Each soldier trapped in these battles confronted the grim reality of war, where strength and bravery were often overshadowed by the inescapable forces around them. History records the victors and the vanquished, but the tales of those trapped, those who fought with no way out, echo longest in our collective memory. These stories remind us that behind every battle lies the endurance, the suffering, and the courage of countless individuals. In reliving these encounters, we honor those who stood their ground, faced impossible odds, and, in their final moments, left us with lessons that resonate far beyond the battlefield. If these stories moved you, please subscribe for more explorations of history's most powerful and haunting moments. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the shadows of the past.